So the key is time is precious. Now let me give you Bill Bailey's description of time. Life is not just the passing of time. Life is a collection of experiences, their frequency, and their intensity. Life is not just watching the clock tick away. Life is a collection of experiences, their intensity, their frequency. Whatever the span of your life turns out to be, here's what you want to fill it up with, experiences and the intensity of those experiences. But now let's talk about the management of time. When should you start the day? As soon as you have it finished. Plan the day the best you can, leaving plenty of room for improvising and surprises and all the stuff that happens during the course of the day. But if you've planned a good, productive day, now you start that day, you can't believe how much more valuable your time will be. Don't start the day until you have it finished. Now here's the next one. Don't start the week until you've had it finished. Now to lay out a week is a pretty good challenge. Next, don't start the month until you have it finished. The places to go and the people to see and the productivity and the sales and the customers and the development and all the rest of what you want to accomplish during the course of 30 days. Don't start the month till it's finished. And then here's the big one. This is really challenging. Don't start the year until you have it finished. To the best of your ability, it can't be finished like minute by minute. But in terms of the sweep of what you want to accomplish, make sure that that's set and ready to go by the time January 1st rolls around. Now, jot this down. Approaches to the management of time. Here's the first one. Ignore the subject. I mean, that's good advice. Don't let anything overly bug you. Because remember now, you don't have to do anything. Someone says, well, I got to get a handle on my time. And the answer is no, you don't. If you want to let it all go, you can let it all go. I mean, this is good advice. Somebody says, you ought, you ought, you ought. Jot this down. Ignore all the you oughts or you should. Only if they're giving general information. We should. It's better to say if you're teaching, we should. Not you should. We should. Then you let me listen in without it being too confrontational. If everyone did this, see, that'd be great. And then you give a person a chance to choose to do it or not to do it. But when you start the you ought, you ought, now see if I don't, now see we've got some tension and maybe some problems. So you ought seem to always create problems. When you're talking to your kids, you say, no, if kids would do this, not always saying if you did this, if you did this, life would be better. But if kids did this, life would be better. It's like making a little talk and letting them listen in. And then it's a little less confrontational. It gives us a choice. In one of my seminars, here's what I teach. All life form strives to the max of its potential except human beings. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it possibly can. You never heard of a tree growing half as high as it could. No, trees don't grow half. A tree drives its roots as deep as it can, reaches as high as it can, produces every leaf it can, every fruit it possibly can. To the max, every life form strives to the max, except human beings. Now, why not human beings? Jot this down. You've been given the dignity of choice. You're not a robot. You don't have to repeat this year the same as last year. You can tear up last year's plan, develop a new plan. So, the dignity of being a human being. Now, here's the choice on being a human being. To be part of all we were meant to be, or to be all. To strive for all, or half, or part, or some. The choice is up to you to develop one skill or ten skills. Someone says, well, I'd be happy with just one more language. Well, some say, hey, I'm going to learn six or seven. And this is all a matter of choice. And when someone says, no, you ought to learn four, you've got to resist all that. Because this is personal dignity. And you don't want to destroy someone's dignity by, by doing all the oughts and they feel reluctant to do it. Now we've got problems. So if you want to, just ignore this subject on time management. Now here's the next one. Step down to something easier. The guy's in sales and he says, oh, I want to own the company. Finally owns the company. Now he's got no time to play golf. He said, when I was in sales, I was making big money playing golf three days a week. Heck with this owning something. Heck with managing. My life was never my own after I started to manage. I'm going back to sales. See, this is the key. 
If you're getting too pressed, you might consider stepping down to something with a little easier time pressure. Next key to time management. And that's work longer and harder. But see, there's a limit to that. I almost lost my health the first year. I went so crazy about personal development and achievement. I just went bonkers. You know, I told you I was skinny. By the end of that first year, I was a walking shadow. And then it suddenly occurred to me, what if I got rich and too ill to spend it? I mean, that was a shocker. So I started, you know, developing a little more reasonable because I said, if 12 hours won't do it, I'll work 14. If that won't do it, I'll work 18. I mean, how many hours it takes. And sure enough, it, it cost me too much. So see, working longer and harder for some might be appropriate. You know, if you're just sitting around not doing that much, this might be good, work longer and harder. But you can only work so hard. Here's the key, not to work harder, but smarter. When you've worked as hard as you can, doing the best you can in terms of physical output in the time, reasonable time. Now here's the ultimate in the management of time, and that is you simply become more skillful. When I first got into sales, you know, I was around people that could get, you know, nine out of 10, eight out of 10. And when I first started, I could only get one out of 10. But here's what I did. I worked around the clock, around the clock, so that I would make up in numbers what I lacked in skill. That's good in sales. You got to jot that down. When you're new, you make up in numbers what you lack in skill. Now, when you become more skillful, the numbers can go down because now your persuasive ability and all of that is now so high that you don't need to put as many numbers out. But at first, if you want to compete or if you want to really get good, you've got to put in the numbers. But if you get more from yourself, develop more of yourself, now the time management becomes an easier task. Now here's the next thing. Either you run the project or it runs you. I've found out when you start something, at first you're in charge. All of a sudden, a year later, it's in charge. Some of the companies I started, I'm telling you, I'm in control. A couple of years later, I'm out of control. At first, I've got it on the run. Two years later, it's got me on the run. Haven't got enough time. I'm dizzy with trying to get it all done. So here's part of the key, and that's to get in charge. Say, I'm going to take charge of my health. Take charge of your time. Take charge of your resources, which we're going to talk about next. You're the one that's responsible for it. It's not a requirement of society that you not have a heart attack and take care of your family. That's not a requirement of society, but you must make it a requirement of yourself. Society doesn't require that you build a financial wall around your family. Nothing can get through. That's not a requirement of society. It's a requirement you impose on yourself to build a financial wall around your family. Nothing can get through. So impose on yourself this self-development of being in charge taking charge of your life and your health and your future and your responsibilities and all the rest. Next, reasonable time is enough time to achieve all of your goals. Just jot that down. Reasonable time is enough time. I had to learn that. Reasonable time is enough time. Here's why. It's not the hours you put in. It's what you put in the hours. If you start depositing greater ideas into the hours you've got later than now, I'm telling you later, you can't believe the productivity that will flow. The ideas you can't think of now, a year from now, they'll start to flow. And when you deposit those ideas in the hours you've got, productivity multiplies by two, three, five, ten. Next, time management essential. We've already covered the first one, a written set of goals. And then do priorities on your goals. What's important this week? What's important this month? Here's the next one. Often review. Just go over your goals to make sure that your list is working for you. It's got you inspired. It's got you turned on. Somebody says, how come you're up so early? Say, if you were headed where I'm headed, you'd be up early too. If you were going to meet who I'm going to meet, you'd be up early. If it was going to stack up for you like it's stacking up for me, you'd be getting up early. Here's some more time management essentials. Learn to study what we call majors and minors. You pick up the phone. Here's what you must say when you pick up the phone. Is this a major conversation or a minor conversation? If it's minor, a few pleasantries and you're done. If it's major, maybe you've got to make a few notes. So here's the next one. Important conversations make an agenda before you make the call. 
just jot down a little agenda. It's so easy now to just talk out of your head. Did you ever hear a conversation end like this? Like this. Let's see, there was something else. See, you don't look that swift. I can't think of it right now. I'll call you back. See, you look a little incompetent. Let's see, there was something. It escapes me right now. Really? So have you got this now? Make an agenda before you make a call if it's an important call. Now, later, that saves you all kinds of stuff. So what's major, what's minor? Now, here's the key on this. Don't major in minor things. If you take up major time to do minor things, I'm telling you, you'll be behind the curve constantly. Here's what we learn in sales training. What's major time and what's minor time? And if you took a look, if you're in sales and you took a look at a week, you'd say, my gosh, I'm spending 90% of my time on the minor stuff and so little time on the major stuff in the presence of. How many hours in the presence of in my day? How many hours in the presence of during my sales week? Because the time that really counts is in the presence of majors and minors. Here's another key time management essential. Don't mistake movement for achievement. It's easy to get faked out by being busy. Guy comes home at night all exhausted, falls in the chair and says, oh, I've been going, going, going. Here's the big question. Doing what? It's not the going, going, going. Some people are going, 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 and they're doing figure eights. Progress is small. So don't mistake movement for achievement. Now, here's a big one, concentration. I had to learn this. All those years ago, I'm in the shower trying to compose a letter. Found it turns out to be a strange letter. So here's what I learned to do. Save the work till you get to the office. Save the work till you get to the work. Don't try to get to the office on the way to work. On the way to work, enjoy the way. In the shower, enjoy the shower. Then go to work when you get to work. I found this to be helpful. Concentration. Here's another big one. Learn to say no. I'm telling you, in such a social society we have now, it's so easy to try to be a nice person saying yes, yes, yes to everything. Find yourself overloaded. Now you've got to call and make the, well, gosh, you know, all the time it takes to back out of something that you said, said yes to too quickly. Here's what might be better. I don't think so, but if that changes, I'll call you. Little things you can use not to commit, overcommit yourself. My friend Ron Reynolds says, don't let your mouth overload your back. It's a good one. Now, here's a big one on time management. When you work, work. When you play, play. Don't mix the two. Don't work at play. I used to take my family to the beach and I would bring my briefcase. I learned not to do that. Or at the beach, I'm saying I should be at the office. I should be at the office. Now my family's upset because I'm at the beach and I'm thinking office, office, office. Now, when I'm at the office, I'm thinking what? I got to get my family to the beach, the beach, the beach. So things are not going too well at the office because I'm thinking beach and things are not going too well at the beach because I'm thinking office. Here's what I learned to do. At the beach, be at the beach. At the office, be at the office. When you work, work. When you play, play. Don't mix the two. Don't work at play. Now, here's one of the most important ones. Don't play at work. Work is too serious. But I'm telling you, you've got to be serious about work because you're parting with a piece of your life for the work you do. Your work costs you a piece of your life. Here's what it's called. Serious business, not grim, not unhappy, but serious. Here's another key phrase. All work is good. You may not like your job, but if it's the stepping stones to get you to where you want to, to go, you've got to appreciate your job. You don't have to have a passion for your job. Here's the ultimate passion, a passion for incredible success in every department of my life. That's the passion. But don't look down on some menial job you have to do to finally get you to where you want to go. No job is menial, menial. No job is not, no, every job is noble. Training life for pay, making a contribution to society. Next, analyze how you are. And if you have some weaknesses, if you can't, doesn't seem like you can change, here's the key, get it covered. I used to keep promising myself I'd keep the books, keep the books, keep the books. Finally, I gave that up. And back then, it only took me an extra 50, 60 bucks a month for some accountant to keep the books. I said, no, I'm going to save the 50 bucks. You can't believe what I started losing in productivity because I tried to save the 50 bucks. So the key is a lot of time you can stay like you are, but just make sure you get it covered. Next. Beware of the telephone and all other systems of communication. 
especially the telephone at home and systems of communication at home. And here's one of the best lines I've got for you for the weekend. Let all communication systems serve you, but don't let them intrude. Here's the next one. Read all the books. You know, I've only got a few notes here on time management. But if you've got some particular challenges, you run a big organization, a big corporation, you've got some challenges, there's plenty of books. Now, here's what's next. Just be more alert to the things that might be stealing your time. Here's why. Time is like capital. You can't let someone steal your seed corn. You can't let someone steal your capital. And you can't let someone steal your time. You must designate your time. And some of the time that you designate, you must not let anyone steal. Casual time, you might let someone intrude and steal a little bit and take a little bit, but not serious time. Next, one of the great time management savers is to learn to ask questions up front. Sometimes you talk to somebody for an hour, and then you ask questions and find out if you would have asked those questions up front, you could have saved yourself an hour. Asking questions up front helps you to get to the problem now. But if you just launch into some discourse, you might waste 30 minutes, waste an hour, when here's what you should have been talking about. After you finished an hour, you say, John, what's really the problem? He said, well, it's something personal. See, that's what you should have been talking about this whole hour. Now, here's the last one, thinking on paper, and that's to keep a journal. One of the things I'm known for around the world, have been now for 39, 40 years, is keeping a journal. Now, my journal is not a... You know, it's not necessarily a, it's not like a diary. It might be part diary. You know, I'm flying over Ireland and I, I write down a few little things that impressed me. Uh, today I met this person. Wow, what an extraordinary event. Uh, today this, I conducted this seminar in Rome. A thousand people stood up and sang for me. I've got a little bit of a diary in there. But here's what primarily your journal is for. Collecting good ideas. A journal is to collect good ideas on your health, good ideas for your business, good ideas for your future, good ideas for time management. Because I used to take notes on pieces of paper and torn off corners and backs of old envelopes and restaurant placemats. And I threw all this stuff in a drawer. It did not serve me well. I finally learned to get a bound copy, right? And just keep a journal, right? If I was here, I had my journal, I'd be taking notes, right? These two days in my journal. Now, if you're caught without your journal, you just take the notes when you get back home, put those notes in your journal, throw the paper away. Because we don't usually go through paper to review. But see, my journals now make up a significant part of my own library. Here's what's next to leave behind, and that's your library. The books that changed your life, the books that changed your health, the books that rescued you from oblivion. The books that you passed on to other people, they were so exciting for you. The books that made you financially independent. The books that developed your leadership. The books that gave you wisdom to ponder when things were tough. The books that got you through the winter. The books that helped you to plant in the spring and harvest in the fall. What a treasure to leave behind. If you do that, here's what's for sure. Your books will be more valuable than your furniture.